Please welcome everyone here to the March meeting of the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. My name is Dariva Belfiore, and I am the treasurer for FACT. FACT began over 25 years ago, back in 1995. We support science, reason, critical thinking, and the thorough investigation of claims using the scientific method. Please see our website, which is www.fact.org to join FACT for $25 per year or to make a donation. Your membership and donations help FACT to sponsor quality speakers like today's speakers, pay our Zoom and meetup costs, and fund activities such as our May excursion and our summer picnic, which are free and open to all. Please also connect to us on Meetup under the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking or our YouTube channel, Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. We have recordings of our speakers there that you can watch anytime. Here are a few important upcoming announcements. Our April meeting is going to be held on a special date, April 23rd. This is not our usual date. Please make note. Michael Marshall from the Merseyside Skeptics in the UK will be speaking on Inside the White Rose, an anti-vax COVID conspiracy theory ecosystem. And you may remember Michael Marshall from his talk last year with FACT about flat earthers. May 7th will be our annual excursion at Valley Forge State Park. That's in person. June 25th will be our annual picnic at the Fort Washington State Park. That's also in person. These events are free and open to everyone. More details will be forthcoming on our website and on Meetup. So here's some important housekeeping information for everyone's good. At the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box for questions for the speakers. You can type them in at any time, but that is the location for questions for the speakers. Please make any questions clear and concise. There's a chat box at the bottom of the screen also that allows you to communicate with each other or with the meeting organizers. So today we welcome Rob Palmer, who will be interviewing Robert Bartholomew about Havana Syndrome. Rob Palmer is a retired aerospace engineer who became a skeptical activist when he joined the Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia project in 2016. He began writing for Skeptical Inquirer in 2018 as the well-known skeptic. Rob takes a special interest in combating beliefs in psychics and mediums. And he's been a speaker twice at SciCon in Las Vegas, as well as virtually for DragonCon and for many humanist and skeptic clubs, including FACT. He did a wonderful interview with the actor John Delancey. I recommend you check that out on the FACT um, YouTube channel. And also, um, please check out Rob's Skeptical Inquirer columns. Now, our other speaker, Robert Bartholomew. Robert Bartholomew is an honorary senior lecturer in the Department of Psychological Medicine at the University of Auckland, a medical sociologist. He's written extensively on mass psychogenic illnesses, hoaxes, popular delusions, and pseudoscience. He's the author of Havana Syndrome, Mass Psychogenic Illness, and the Real Story Behind the Embassy Mystery and Hysteria, along with UCLA neurologist Robert Bailo. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Yep. He began his career as a journalist for several New York State radio stations and has lived with the Malay people in Malaysia and the Aborigines in the uh, Tanami Desert of Central Australia. He completed his PhD in sociology from James Cook University in Australia and his master's in sociology from the State University of New York at Albany. Robert is a fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and to date, he has published 17 books and 80 articles in peer-reviewed journals. So please join me as I welcome Rob Palmer and Robert Bartholomew. Take it away, Rob Palmer. Uh, thank you, Dariva. And welcome, uh, Dr. Bartholomew. Um, thank you. We've agreed I can call you Robert. Uh, maybe a little easier than 
their whole name each time. Uh, thanks for joining us today, all the way from New Zealand at this early hour. What time is it there? Uh, 7.08. Wow. Um, so, yeah. So let's start with uh, you explaining what Havana syndrome is as presented to the public by the U.S. government and through the media. In short, take off your, your uh, psychological hat and what do most people see when they hear about this? What is the official story about Havana syndrome? Well, I think back to August of 2017, when I first heard about this and it was announced by the State Department. And the story basically is that there were a group of American diplomats and intelligence officers in Havana, Cuba, and starting in late 2016 and extending into 2018 and even 2019, that they were the subject of initially sonic, meaning weapons using sound waves and microwave attacks. And they had an, an array of symptoms, headache, nausea, uh, dizziness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, disorientation, uh, confusion, insomnia, uh, balance problems, um, brain damage, hearing loss, uh, concussion-like symptoms, and I don't want to be first, flip, flip here, but is there any symptom that wasn't included in this? Well, that's a good, uh, good observation. Um, there's just an array of uh, symptoms that have been associated with Havana syndrome. And of course, this got played up in the media. And then a couple of studies came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it's been widely reported that uh, the victims in Cuba have suffered from brain damage and these mysterious uh, so-called immaculate concussions, a concussion without a concussion. Um, so that's the main story. And when I heard that story, I thought, my goodness, this is terrible. There's a foreign power who is attacking uh, American citizens in Cuba. Isn't that terrible? And since then it's spread around the world. There have been over a thousand cases now uh, beyond Cuba and the reports keep coming in. So in a nutshell, that's the story that's being presented in the media, specifically that there's brain damage, that there's hearing loss, and there are these concussion-like symptoms. And it's been proven in studies such as the Journal of the American Medical Association. So it must be true. So, yeah, so, and, and this has been ongoing since 2016, 2017, right? Right up to the present day. That's correct. Yeah. So. Um, I did a very unscientific survey on my Facebook page uh, asking my followers who are largely skeptics because of the nature of my page and asked them, uh, you know, if they had heard of this, number one, number two, if they had to give like, what do they think of it? And uh, I was kind of fascinated because although this is a skeptic group, only 63% had heard about it. So that's a fairly large number who didn't even know what this was. And then of the people who answered the question, well, do you think it's real? What do you think it is? Less than half were highly skeptical. Um, it was kind of hard. I went through the, you know, each one's a little paragraph and okay, do you really believe this or not? But in my opinion, about 45%, uh, I would say were highly, only 45% were highly skeptical. You know, this is BS, uh, this can't be, you know, weapons can't do that. But that leaves, you know, the majority of people who were either just, I don't know what to think or, they, in fact, believed it was real, and even maybe some minority of that, oh, it's probably not what the government's saying, it's some other cause, and they listed some different people listed different things. So, and that tracks with my personal conversations on this in the last four years. Every time I would bring up the skeptical point of view, my friends would think I'm wearing a tinfoil hat. It's like, how can you not believe this? It's reported in the media, the government says it's true, JAMA, if they knew what that was. So are you surprised by any of that? I am, and I'm really disappointed in the media. One of the uh, jobs I had in early, um, it had been about 1984, 1985, I worked for a CNN radio affiliate in Albany, New York. I've uh, worked for seven different radio stations as a, as a journalist in the late 1970s into the 1980s, and I'm really disappointed in the mainstream news media, um, CNN, NBC, CBS, who have clearly 
got it wrong. I don't think they've got it wrong. I know they've got it wrong. And that's not arrogance. That's just, I know what the facts are. I know what they're reporting. And it's simply not true. Okay. So let's talk about that. So you've been following this closely uh, with your background since 2016, I guess. And in 2020, you co-authored the book, uh, Havana Syndrome, with the subtitle, which gives away your point of view, Mass Psychogenic Illness and the Real Story Behind the Embassy Mystery and Hysteria. And even before you published that book, you did a bunch of interviews on this subject. You gave one to me for Skeptical Inquirer. Um, and the teaser for today's interview asks if the attacks were actually happening, or is this a case of political blunders, sloppy science, and bad journalism? Yeah. And I know your answer to that is yes, yes, and yes. Yeah. Um, so first, please summarize your training and background regarding this uh, subject, and also explain what MPI is and isn't. And then you can give us your, your hypothesis of what's going on. Well, people keep saying to me that, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Concussion-like symptoms, white matter tract changes, hearing loss, brain damage. Um, you don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about mass psychogenic illness. I did part of my PhD on mass psychogenic illness and the history. I've written an encyclopedia on the subject. I have probably published more articles in peer-reviewed journals on the topic than anyone else alive. My PhD committee chair, uh, was Arthur Kleiman, the former head of social medicine at Harvard University. I have a pretty good understanding of uh, mass psychogenic illness. And um, so that's my background as a uh, medical sociologist. And when I think of this case, I think of a line from Shakespeare in A Midsummer Night's Dream, or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush suppose it a bear. And kind of to summarize this whole episode, I can summarize everything in one sentence. When you hear the sound of hoofbeats in the night, first think horses, not zebras. The doctors at the American State Department went for the most exotic hypothesis early on. They were going for unicorns when they should have stuck to mundane explanations. And I think you cannot underestimate the power of the E word. And I think that's driving this. And the E word is embarrassment, that the United States government has spent the last five years and wasted tens of millions of dollars and got people needlessly upset and for something that never happened. And so that's a little bit about my background. And um, yes. Yeah. So, so what, what is mass psychogenic illness? I mean, I, I've heard, you know, reporters put in art, I've seen reporters put in articles and I've even heard politicians at one point saying, well, people don't make stuff up. That's what mass psychogenic illness is. Think of mass psychogenic illness as the placebo effect in reverse. If I give you a sugar pill and tell you, you're going to feel better often you will. It's the power of the mind. It's the power of belief. It's the power of expectation. It's the power of framing. But if I give you a sugar pill and tell you you're going to feel better, then someone rushes in and says, oh my gosh, that sugar pill I just gave you, it's been contaminated with rat poison. There's a good chance that within a few minutes, you might get headache, nausea, stomach pain. You might even vomit, but there's nothing physically wrong with you. Think of it as a software problem an overstimulation of the nervous system. And also keep in mind that uh, many neurologists, many medical professionals, when people come to them, they, uh, the people are suffering from anxiety uh, related illnesses or conditions. It's, it's very common. And so in the psychology, you've got what's known as the nocebo effect the evil twin of the placebo that most people are aware of. So um, your book has crickets on the cover. So how does that relate to this? I heard some story about the State Department actually recording these sounds in, uh, in Havana and then somebody saying, oh, this is clearly the frequency of a sonic weapon. And then after they played it to people to say, be aware of the sound, it can mean you're under attack. Then etymologists said, oh, those are crickets. Is that true? Well, look, to understand this case, 
you have to go back in time to patient zero. Episodes of mass psychogenic illness and social panics never occur in a vacuum. There's always a historical backdrop. So in late 2016, you had a group of CIA agents operating a small unit in Havana. And most of them were located, their homes in a posh section of Havana. And they were walking outside their homes at night and making an unusual observation. There was this strange sound and they, they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And it was like a beam of sound was pointed at their homes. And then in late December of 2016, one of those CIA officers walked into the American Embassy Medical Clinic with a headache, ear pain, and some hearing loss, which is not unusual for someone to walk in with symptoms like that to a, a doctor's office. And he made an unusual observation. He said, you know, it's like someone's pointing this beam of sound at my home. I'm wondering he actually if that, said that might have something to do with my symptoms. He actually said that. He actually said that. And they didn't think much of it, but then a couple of other CIA officers had said the same thing. And this folk theory emerged that they were the victims of some new secret weapon using sound waves to target their victims. And initially you think, well, that's kind of a, a, a stretch. However, there's a long history of American agents and diplomats who were stationed in Cuba historically, who were aggressively targeted by the Cubans. It was well known, it was part of CIA folklore when they, under the Obama administration, reopened the embassy in 2015. They were counseled and told, the Cubans are very aggressive, you'll be surveilled 24 seven. Often they will do things like uh, if you park your car somewhere, someone will park within inches of you so you can't pull out again. You have to wait for someone. Um, people in the past, you, you wake up in the morning and find that all the windows of your home have been opened and that you've got a lot of mosquito bites. People would wake up in the morning, walk downstairs and look on their kitchen table and there'd be cigarette butts and you don't smoke. There'd be dog poo on your kitchen floor and you don't have a dog. Um, some of the books in your bookshelf would be rearranged. It was their calling card to let you know that they were there. Watched. And so that's the historical backdrop. And that's why they went for the unicorns early on. And so to make a long story short, of the first 21 victims of Havana syndrome, eight of them made recordings during the attacks. Those recordings were analyzed in 2018 by a group of classified scientists, some of the top scientists in the world looking at and analyzing audio, sound. And they concluded that those recordings were the mating calls of the Indies short-tailed cricket, which is one of the loudest crickets in the world. They're very loud. And um, that was the conclusion. And so people have mistaken the sounds of crickets for some type of attack. Now, initially it was thought to be a, an acoustical attack. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as a, a ray gun where you can point it at a building and target the people inside. 99% um, of the sound waves would bounce off the outer wall for starters. Now, none of the attacks occurred at the American embassy. They occurred at one of two large hotels in Havana in an apartment complex and in the homes of the diplomats. So that's where the attacks took place. And so when you look at a sonic weapon, it would have to be large and you'd have to like bring it outside the people's homes and target them in their homes or in these large hotels. And it would defy the laws of physics to be able to target 
specific individual people in those hotels when other people standing next to them didn't hear anything. Um, and, then, and then after the initial sonic attack theory came out, it was uh, pesticides. But there's no, because they were spraying for the Zika virus in Havana at the time that this came out. But there's no neurotoxin in the world that only affects American and Canadian diplomats and their families. And then, so they came out with microwaves. It must be microwaves. Well, first of all, those eight people who recorded those attacks, it wasn't microwaves because you can't record microwaves. They're not a sound wave. The microwave strikes your head and stimulates um, a nerve in the inner ear and the vestibular system, which creates the perception of sound. And it's not a sound wave, so it can't be recorded as an audio sound. So it's not the so-called fray effect uh, or microwaves. And if it was microwaves, it would, and there was brain damage, you would have that show up on an MRI and that's not the case. Okay, so let's get into that a little bit, but actually I, I, the cricket noises, was I wrong about that? Well, am I remembering something wrong? I, I, I had heard that cricket noises were played to people that were going to be sent out to embassies or it was sent to other embassies and people were told to be aware of this noise and report any medical symptoms you have. Did that happen? That's exactly correct. They took some of those recordings and they played them for new staff who were about to go over to Cuba. And they told them, this is what a sonic attack sounds like. Oh my God, was this if before or after the scientists, the insect scientists had identified it? Well, this was, this was early on. Um, okay. This would have been um, February, March, April, May of 2017. And they were told, this is what a sonic attack sounds like. If you're on the X, get off the X, the X being wherever you're standing at any given time. And so there was also the FBI report, which hasn't been completely released, but we know the conclusions of the FBI report. The FBI concluded exactly as we have, that it was a mass psychogenic illness. And they also, uh, they, they took some of the recordings and went to this expert um, on insects in the Caribbean and the ones that they had that they played for him, uh, he said, oh, um, definitely insect, most likely cicada um, for those recordings. But the other recordings were concluded to be the, uh, the frequency of the, uh, the ND short-tailed cricket. Amazing. And so, you know, I, I would assume, okay, the government here is insect scientists actually clearly identify with this is stop playing the sound as a weapon, but then comes along the JAMA study. So the Journal of the Medi American Medical Association, uh, University of Penn Neurologists published reports that in fact, these victims had brain damage, right? And then there was a uh, laryngoscopy investigative uh, otolaryngology. I don't know what that is. That's another one I saw. There was some study in those. Can you talk about those and why is, why are those perceived as being real evidence when I'm presuming you think they're not? Well, I know they're not. And uh, here's, here's the thing. The Journal of the American Medical Association is one of the top medical journals in the world. There's no question about it. But the issue is they have people who are editors there who are known as human beings. And they screwed up. I challenge right now, I challenge the editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association to come out and make a statement in support of their 2018 and 2019 Havana Syndrome studies. I challenge them to come out and say that those are good studies and that they show that brain damage occurred. And they're not gonna do that because they screwed up. There's no other way to describe it. And they know they screwed up because when I talk to journalists, I say, you should talk to them, ask them these questions. And they always come back with the same thing, uh, no comment. Yeah, it's no comment because they, they messed up. These Is it the same studies, group of people? Same group of people, first report and second report? Yep. Oh, oh no, there's, there's different authors, but uh, you'd have similar editors. And um, so look, in 2018, well, let's go back. 
um, late 2017 into 2018. The media reported that um, many of the victims of Havana syndrome that were being studied in this uh, study that was likely to be published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, they reported that there were these mysterious white matter tract changes to the victim's brains. And that was out there for nearly a year before the study actually came out. And then in early 2018, I believe it was February, the JAMA study, Journal of the American Medical Association study came out. And they found that three of the patients they looked at had white matter tract changes. Two were mild, one was moderate. If you randomly pick a group of about two dozen people who were analyzed and randomly pick them off the streets of Philadelphia this morning, you would have a similar breakdown because white matter tract changes are common in everything from depression to dementia, to normal aging, to migraines. So they use no control group? No, no. And, and that's the issue. That's the issue with these people. And what they did was they had a threshold of impairment for Havana syndrome at 40%. It should have been closer to 5%. And here is the mystery. It's how the article ever got published in the first place. And, and Robert Balo was the head of the UCLA Neurotology Center from 1974 until recently. So this he is the co-author co co -author with you on the whole. Co-author of the book. He is one of the foremost experts on the vestibular system the, of the inner ear that deals with balance and spatial awareness. Um, he's written the standard textbook in the field. And so he told me, he said, you know, he goes, the JAMA people contacted me because I created some of the tests that they're actually using in these studies. And I'm the expert in the area. They contacted me and they said, can you review this article for us? And I did. And he said, of the probably 1,000 articles, he's peer-reviewed uh, peer reviewed articles that he has been involved with in his entire career. And he's about 80 now. He said, they always give you the review comments from the other reviewers. The only time that didn't happen was in this case. They didn't show him any of the other reviews if there were other reviews. And so he looked at the article and he rejected it. And they published it anyway. And he was really surprised by that. Now, jump ahead to 2019. The, so you got the 2019 Journal of the American Medical Association study, and they came out and they said they found brain anomalies in these patients they looked at in Cuba. And this got reported in the media as brain damage. That's absolutely uh -huh. unequivocally not true. Oh, I it's remember not all the media stories with that clickbait headline. I remember them brain damage, yep. you know, verified in victims of Havana syndrome. So brain anomalies are not brain damage. What they essentially found were minor brain changes. It's not unusual to find minor brain changes in small cohorts like that. Um, just like if we looked at the teeth of um, everyone on the um, executive council of fact, um, you'd find some anomalies, right? There's always gonna be variations from, from the mean. And so the brain anomalies brain changes got reported as brain damage. But here's the thing. If you look at that study, it was very poorly done to the point where it really shouldn't have been published. 12 of the patients of the diplomats in Cuba had histories of concussion compared to how many in the control group, healthy controls, zero. That alone could account for the findings that they had. And the editor of the journal Cortex, which is Dr. Sergio Delicello, a neuroscientist at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, him 
and the entire editorial board of the journal Cortex, which is a respected brain journal, European-based, called for the 2018 article to be retracted um, because there were so many issues they had with that article. And that's why I say, I welcome uh, the editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association to come out and, and explain how those articles ever got published in the first place. And I'd also like to know if it actually was peer reviewed. Um, the 2018 article talked about, uh, and then they had this JAMA network where they do radio interviews. And one of the authors, the lead author was on there the 2018 study, and he was talking about how they eliminated mass psychogenic illness. He said uh, something to the effect of, well, clearly um, there was no collusion involved because the patients were not uh, faking symptoms together. Well, that's not mass psychogenic illness. Um, mass psychogenic illness is not collusion. People aren't faking their symptoms. And how that ever got and a publication with the Journal of the American Medical Association is beyond me. Um, it's, it's really concerning. And it's concerning that they still do the no comment thing at JAMA. That is absolutely amazing. So how does the National Academy of Science report uh, fold into this? Well, it's so disturbing what happened. When I think of the National Academy of Sciences, I think of objectivity. And we have to remember, I think, partly that this started under the Trump administration. Um, which yeah, we're going to get into the politics of this in a bit. Yep. And so the National Academy of Sciences comes out and they study this. And in December of 2020, it's leaked. It's leaked to the press. And so then they came out with their study, first week in December of 2020. And they said, basically, if you look at the study, um, we're not sure what's going on, but if we had to make a guess, it's pulse microwave radiation. Um, here's some things that people don't know about that. Well, so what kind of thing is that to say, if we had to make a guess, that's just- yeah, Essentially, much. that's what they did. And um, so they came out and said that, that was their conclusion. But here's what people don't know. There were no experts on the panel on pulse microwave radiation or mass psychogenic illness. They did have an expert on the panel to begin with, Professor Simon Wesley at King's College London, one of the foremost experts on mass psychogenic illness in the world. I published four articles with him. He's top notch. He gave an interview to, I believe it was a Rhode Island radio station in which they asked him about the panel. And he said, oh, he goes, based on what I've seen, the possibility of mass psychogenic illness is, is, is very much in there. And um, right after that, they kicked him off the panel. Oh. So he's no longer on the panel. Um, well, and no, who's, so, who, who made that decision? Who is they? Well, David Relman at Stanford University is the head of the panel. By the way, David Relman, who's very good in his field, he's a microbiologist. Um, he's not an expert on the vestibular system. And he keeps giving interviews in which he says there was vestibular system damage. Well, my question is, how come they didn't put somebody like Bob Balo on the panel? who is one of the foremost experts on the vestibular system, and by the way, has written the only book by scientists on this subject. Um, but they didn't, and they didn't interview him or they didn't interview us. And there's a whole number of skeptics out there. Uh, John Stone at Edinburgh, um, Sergio Della Sella, um, who are very well respected, who are skeptical, didn't interview any of us at all. So they piled up the believers in terms of the people who they interviewed on that panel. Here's the other thing. The National Academy of Sciences panel, which cited my research um, a number of times as an expert on mass psychogenic illness, then went out and said, you know, mass psychogenic illness is a legitimate hypothesis, but we can't adequately assess it. 
because there's no information on the early epidemiological spread from patient to patient. Well, that's not true. Eight months earlier, we came out with our book in May of 2020, in which we clearly showed the early epidemiological spread from patient zero. And in ProPublica, Tim Golden, a journalist who went to Cuba, interviewed many of the people at the embassy, um, got a hold of a number of classified documents. Uh, Tim Golden clearly outlined the early epidemiological spread. He did that a couple of years before this happened, and they ignored that. They ignored that that publication was there and our book. And the most amazing thing to me is, I listened to an interview with David Relman not long ago, in which he was saying um, a lot of their investigation was conducted, their, their meetings were conducted over Zoom because of the pandemic, and that a lot of the information they got that they analyzed was open source information. Um, it wasn't like secret documents and stuff like that that it was from looking at the JAMA studies and just talking to people over Zoom and interviewing them. They did have some face-to-face -face meetings as well before the pandemic hit where they'd interview uh, experts. But again, it was a loaded deck in terms of the people who they interviewed. And I think what you've got here is the State Department doctor who, who was the head of the... Um, chief medical officer for the United States State Department. I contacted him and I told him um, that his last name is, is Dr. Uh, Cohen, Mark Cohen. I said, look, our study's about to come out. I'm happy to send you a copy of the book. The NAS panel was commissioned by the State Department and Dr. Cohen, I'm happy to send you our findings. He responded, thank you very much, but he didn't take me up on the offer. But they, the, the panel was certainly aware that our book was out there and oh. they chose to ignore it. They knew all our other stuff. They cited all my other articles and Dr. Balow's articles, but they conveniently left out the material in the book. So... Is it the, I, I know I'm at, this is asking you to get into their heads, but is the reason for this because they just don't understand MPI or, or I've heard the term it's an unacceptable diagnosis or they're being pushed to do it this way for some reason? Honestly, I don't know. And I would love to interview David Relman at Stanford and, and ask him those questions. But I think what you've got here is politics mixing with science. He, he commissioned the panel, uh, Mark Cohen at the State Department, and he was there and he gave a keynote address when it opened up. But the State Department had a bias. The State Department had already come out and was talking about acoustical weapons. Yeah. They should have stayed entirely out of it. Okay, so- Not even been there and let them do their job. Let's get deep into the political angle then. Um, so this whole thing started just weeks into the Trump administration. And uh, I understand you believe that his anti-Cuban bias in Washington, you know, they didn't want to normalize relations, which had Ob Obama had started, uh, helped drive it in this direction. And, and this is a quote that you gave me and is in my Skeptical Inquirer uh, article from 2019. Any talk of sonic weapons attacks is science fiction. I have no doubt that the Trump administration, which has consistently claimed that an attack took place, including Trump himself saying so, now realize that they have made a mistake, but they do not want to admit it. As for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearings, which happened uh, just before we talked, I think, chaired by Senator Marco Rubio, it was a sham. So please elaborate on that and you know how you see that playing into it. Well, it was disturbing seeing that um... Uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, meeting, which I believe was uh, January of uh, 2018, just before the first JAMA study came out in February of 2018. And Marco Rubio was talking about 
So do you think it's just uh, hypochondriacs, people making this up? Well, that's not mass psychogenic illness. And he's come out, Marco Rubio, and he said, any, any scientist who supports the mass psychogenic illness explanation is a quack. Wow. Um, so it shows to me that he doesn't know what he's talking about and politics is mixed up here. Now, let me tell you something that a lot of people may not know. I went to Cuba just before the lockdown and I went to their medical conference. And I've talked to two people who were scheduled to give presentations at Cuba and at the Havana Syndrome Conference. One of them told me, and I, they don't wanna be named, that um, after they stated that they were gonna speak in Cuba, it was three or four FBI agents went to their university, showed up at their office, and told them that they know things that um, they didn't know, and that um, it would be unpatriotic to go to Cuba and present information that um, is really essentially going against the United States government's uh, view on this. And uh, when that individual who I talked to told me, is quite shaken by that, told me that uh, they decided that they were gonna go anyway, they went to the legal office of that university and told them that it was not a good idea that that person go to Cuba and that they might be arrested as a spy. Because, uh, and, and that's absolutely true. It happened. And that person who was a very prominent scientist um, was shaken by that. And so you've clearly got politics mixed up here. The other thing is you've clearly got a FOIA trail and I love, I put in a FOIA request back like four years ago, and I'm still waiting. And that's another anomaly about this whole episode is releasing the FOIA documents. Um, why don't they release the FOIA documents? Release the FBI report, which concluded it was mass psychogenic illness. Um, and so you've got a paper trail here, and I'd love to see the FOIA documents and, and what happened there, because there must be a paper trail as to why they did that. Because we do know that at the same time, the FBI concluded it was mass psychogenic illness. So why would they have done that? And I think the only explanation that I can come up with is it was um, politics mixing with science. So your quote from 2019 following the one I read already, I have no doubt that the Trump administration, which has consistently claimed that an attack took place, now realize they have made a mistake, but they do not want to admit it. Yep. So, so look, you, you've got an overlap here. You've got bureaucrats from the Trump administration overlapping with bureaucrats from the Biden administration. And I think you've got people in the administration who want to deliberately muddy the waters and make this sound like a mystery. And yeah, it's yeah. embarrassing to think that for five years, the United States government, one of the most powerful uh, governments, well-educated societies, most scientific societies in the world, have mistaken the sound of mating insects for a sonic or microwave attack and wasted tens of millions of dollars and falsely accused foreign governments like Russia, China, and the Cubans of being complicit and being involved in this uh, when the evidence wasn't there. So now you've got these uh, panels coming out. So you got the 2018 so-called Jason panel of elite scientists who looked at this. And they concluded that mass psychogenic illness likely paid, played a major role and that the so-called fray effect with microwaves was extremely unlikely. For starters, you should have, um, it should be doing things like, if it was microwaves, it would knock out the Wi-Fi system. It would affect computers. Um, and also you couldn't record the sounds as audio recordings, right? And recently the Jason report has updated their report and basically said the same thing. Um, that was in November of 2021. And so then you've got the NAS report coming out in December of 2020. 
You got the CDC came out with a report in which they said, we don't know. Um, you've got the FBI report, which was leaked saying it's mass psychogenic illness. And then in January of 2022, the main CIA came out with an interim report in which they said of the over 1000 cases that have been collected, that the vast majority can be explained as people having medical conditions that have been redefined under a new label, or they use the word anxiety, which is a code word for mass psychogenic illness as well. Um, and that there's only a small number of cases that were classified as unexplainable. Now that reminds me of past US government investigations of UFOs, right? Is that the vast majority can be explained. There's a small number of unexplained. And what's going on there? Well, insufficient data to make an accurate assessment, right? And that's what you're seeing here. There's insufficient data at the present time to make an adequate assessment. And so sure. Which always after leaves that, it open. That always leaves it open for the believers. And the same thing with UFOs. You can't explain 1% of them. Therefore, they're aliens. And a few days after that interim CIA report came out, a small panel of outside science advisors to the CIA said, we believe the most likely explanation is pulse microwave radiation. I believe that panel was under a lot of pressure to come out with that. Um, so you've got the group of elite scientists, specialist scientists, the so-called Jason scientists coming out and saying, um, there's no evidence for um, a foreign actor here. You've got the FBI saying it's straight up mass psychogenic illness. You got the main CIA saying it's the same, that it's a variety of phenomena going on, but no evidence of a foreign actor. And then you've got this outlier, which is this small advisory panel. Funny thing, if you look at that advisory panel and look closely, the head of that panel was David Roman, the head of the National Academy of Sciences panel, which concluded, by the way, the same thing, that it was most likely pulse right, microwave radiation. Why you have the same person on this, a different panel, I don't know. But, um, and so, you know, when you get small groups like that and you reach conclusions, you know, there's a whole dynamic going on with small groups and in, in, in coming to a conclusion and what you reach there. And um, so I'm going with the main CIA. And just keep in mind that a lot of this was open sourced as well. It's not like, it, if anything, the main CIA, the FBI and the Jason group had every document that the Roman group had, and I'm sure more. And so how can you get three panels looking at something and concluding one thing, and then you've got this, this other group headed by Roman concluding something else? So at, at the top level, are you surprised that there wasn't a U-turn when Biden became president? Like, what's his motivation for keeping this fiction going? And just so people know, because this wasn't widely publicized, Biden signed into law uh, late last year the Havana Act. And Havana, in this case, is an acronym for helping American victims afflicted by neurological attacks. So now this is part of the U.S. legal code. Like, what, what well, was the motivation? What happened was in September of 2021, Pamela Spratlin, a former U.S. ambassador to a couple of Asian countries, she'd been, um, she'd been the head of the Biden panel on this. And in September 2021, she did a, a Zoom call with a number of Havana Syndrome patients. And at that time, the contents of the FBI report had been leaked, in which they concluded it was mass psychogenic illness. And one of them asked her, what do you think about that? Do you think it could be mass psychogenic? You don't believe that, do you? And she said, I'm keeping all my options open. Mass psychogenic illness is a possibility. Well, within days, she was forced to resign Ugh. because of the outcry from Havana syndrome patients that she could think 
that it's um, mass psychogenic illness. People were going out and doing interviews on CNN and these other major networks saying, we're not crazy. We don't have mass psychogenic illness. I'm not suffering from a mental disorder. Mass psychogenic illness is not a mental disorder. It is a collective stress response based on a belief. We all have beliefs. Therefore, we are all potentially susceptible to mass psychogenic illness. That tells you all you need to know that the investigation was being driven by politics and not science. And therein lies the concern. And the other point I wanna make here, it's very important. People say to me, they say, okay, um, but how can you explain this is, this is spread all over the world? Well, you've got two different things going on here. You've got the initial outbreak in Cuba. And then you've got the State Department issuing alerts in late 2017, 2018 for American diplomats and intelligence officers all over the world to be on the lookout for symptoms of Havana syndrome and to report them. And so you've got people waking up in the morning, feeling a bit queasy, having a headache, nausea, dizziness, and thinking they've got Havana syndrome, right? Because the symptoms are so vague. And then recently, the Department of Defense issued an alert to all 2.9 million service personnel to be on the lookout for symptoms of Havana syndrome over the past five years. And so the problem here is the symptoms of Havana syndrome are headache, nausea, uh, dizziness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, forgetfulness, confusion, insomnia, uh, tinnitus, head pressure. Problems of uh, life. Um, nosebleeds, um, depression, that's been added in there as well. Ear pain, along with the claims of brain damage and hearing loss, which by the way, never happened. Uh, and so you get this situation where people all over the world are told about this. And you're thinking back over five years, and now you've got lawyers involved and potential compensation as well. And it's exciting to think that just like when you walk outside in your backyard at night and you look up, if you stare long enough, you'll see an object you can't identify, an unidentified flying object. Maybe you've seen an extraterrestrial spacecraft and it's exciting, right? Just like that, it's exciting to think that you may have been the subject of a microwave attack, right? And it's just so vague and so ambiguous. Uh, it, it, it's distressing. And so one of the more recent, just a few weeks ago, I think, um, and widely publicized reports on this was from CBS News on 60 Minutes. And I made some audio clips here. I'm gonna ask you your opinion on. Um, so th this report featured John Bolton, the former US National Security Advisor, and the current CIA Director, William Barnes. Um, the report had not a skeptical voice in it. The whole tone of it was, this is happening, we're in trouble. And so here, here's the first clip. This is um, John Bolton uh, and reporter Scott Pelley uh, discussing the supposed 29 incident in London where members of Bolton staff became ill. More than a fluke, a pattern across two administrations. Recent injuries among US officials were reported in Vienna, Austria ahead of a trip by the vice president to Vietnam and in India during a visit by the director of the CIA. In 2019, during a visit by President Trump to London, two members of John Bolton's national security staff became ill in a hotel. And uh, that it was on the floor where uh, it would completely taken up with personnel from the White House and White House agencies. Uh, struck me as being uh, pretty good evidence of a deliberate attack. You believe it was an attack? I, I don't think there's any other hypothesis when you begin to look at the the number and the pattern that we've experienced. So like, yeah, I don't think there's any other hypothesis. Clearly, he's never heard of mass psychogenic illness or just dismissed out of hand as nonsense. Well, look, I know that when I'm in a, in a 
hotel and I'm with other members of the group and we've, we've got the whole floor to ourselves, if a couple of people feel unwell, it must be a microwave attack. Um, it's sure. just so vague. I mean, he's not an expert in that area. And sure. uh, it's, it's so frustrating. And especially, look, what they are describing when they describe the symptoms are very common neurological symptoms that people experience, mm -hmm. especially as you get older. And you um, just said the whole floor was filled with staff. If you have a huge number of people right there, you're going to have some people not feeling well at any given time. It's amazing to me that his conclusion was there's no other reason for this, but it was an attack. I, I don't I don't get it. So here, here's um, this is a current CIA director. So um, Bolton was from the previous administration, but this is the new director of the CIA. Uh, and this is his take on it. The new director of the CIA, William Burns, told us one thing is already clear after early disbelief. These injured Americans can no longer be doubted. The new director of the... So, yeah, they can no longer be doubted. Well, that, that's amazing. And so here's Burns himself talking about uh, an incident. In my first week as director, I began what had become dozens and dozens of meetings with affected officers and family members. And I found their stories to be powerful and compelling and sometimes heartbreaking. Bill Burns had heard those stories from CIA officers who reported injuries since 2016. But this past fall, while on an official visit to India, a member of his staff was stricken in their hotel. Later, Burns personally escorted that staff member to medical evaluations. It seems that the Delhi incident might have been intended to send you a message. I don't know. And as I said, I can't comment on individual cases here as well. All I can tell you is that each story I've heard, each officer I've met with who's been affected by this just redoubles my commitment and my determination on this issue. Yeah. Um, do you have the clip with the um, with the child? And uh, no, I didn't, do, I, didn't, I didn't do that okay. one. And, 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 and so, look, it's, it's just it's very frustrating here. Um, th you want to tell us about you want to tell us about the yeah. child? Tell us about the child. That was interesting. So, look, you had this family who was stationed in China. And in 2017, they reported a number of attacks in their home and they were medically evacuated to the United States and they were undergoing evaluation and treatment. Um, and they were staying at a hotel in Philadelphia. And the guy claims that they were attacked again while they were staying in the hotel. And that um, even Philadelphia up, is not safe. He got up and, and his children were thrashing around in their sleep. You can see them moving around in their beds. Well, there's something called night terrors, which is quite common. It's like 40% of all children or something. And any anyway, so that could potentially explain why they were thrashing around. Then he said he reached down to pick up the first child and to comfort them. And then he reached down to pick up the second child to comfort them. And as he reached down each time, he heard a whooshing sound like water running. Well, I Googled that as I was researching the case. And it's a very common symptom of tinnitus. And, and in fact, there's an audiologist who had written an article called, is that the water running or is that tinnitus? So you got this very common symptom. And the implication, if you are watching the program is, oh, that whooshing sound, that water running sound may have been a microwave attack. These people at 60 Minutes aren't stupid. They are intelligent journalists. They're seasoned. Why wouldn't you run that by a neurologist? Or maybe they did. If you're I, looking into this, I mean, it's it. And, and most neurologists would would have told you, oh, that's a very common symptom of of uh, tinnitus. By the way, oh, really? Okay, it, it's not. Is it a common symptom of a microwave attack? I'm going for tinnitus over microwave attack. 
So, so here's the closing quote from the, the 60 Minutes report, which just tells me, I don't know, they're the worst journalists in the world or they just were going for sensationalism. This past summer in Geneva, President Biden raised the issue with Russian President Putin. The Russians deny they're involved. The Secret Service declined to comment on White House security. The iron gates of West Executive Avenue by the West Wing went up in 1951 after the attempted assassination of Harry Truman. 70 years later, there is evidence the gates may have been breached by an invisible threat. Now, to put that in context, I didn't play that part, but part of this report were two people who claimed to have been attacked at the White House. That's right. And look, um, the suggestion was that the Russians could attack and potentially incapacitate, this was discussed, the president and his cabinet, if they wanted to. That's dangerous stuff. Absolutely. When there's a war going on in Ukraine. Because as I mentioned in my skeptic article, I think it's 50-50 whether you start getting some reports now. And it wouldn't surprise me if there already are reports of uh, people getting sick. And then for the US government to think, oh, maybe this is the Russians attacking us. That's a dangerous thing at this time. And look, if it's so obvious, if the Russians have a weapon that, and it's over a dozen countries now, people claim to have been attacked. If they've got this weapon and they've developed it and they can incapacitate people, how come, you know, President Zelensky in Ukraine, they certainly want to take him out or incapacitate him. How come they don't point it at him? How come instead of having these artillery pieces and tanks amassed going into Ukraine, how come they don't have large sonic and microwave weapons that they're bringing into the country? And you can leave the infrastructure and just point it at buildings, incapacitate people and clear them out. It doesn't make any sense. Um, there was a case, an example in Colombia, where a US diplomat um, said that he and his family had been attacked in their home at night. So you mean to tell me that the Russians working with the Cubans have developed this new microwave device and they've spent you know, tens of millions of dollars to develop this and they're using it to what, fly it down to, to Colombia to go out to this poor diplomat's home and harass his wife and kids at night. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And in this case, it's a duck. So let's talk about one other, at least one other bird. Uh, so in your book, which I found fascinating, I'm actually writing a book review of it because I didn't find many book reviews out there and I'm gonna write one for Skeptical Inquirer. Um, you give a lot of case studies from history. Um, and maybe you can pick one of these out and talk to it as it you know, pertains to the same kind of thing as going on with the Venice and Rome. Um, I have like 10 listed and were even more than that. 17th century Salem witch hunts, the 18th century glass harmonica, not with an H, glass harmonica. I never heard of that instrument. Ben Franklin popularized it. I was fascinated. Uh, the 18th century French and Indian wars and bullfrogs, which sounds to me kind of like crickets. The 19th century introduction of telephones and electric light bulbs caused problems. I had never heard of this. There was a cabbage snake affair in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, there was residential gas attacks in US homes uh, in World War II time. There was a Montreal slasher, a phantom slasher in Taiwan, poison gas attacks in the West Bank on a girls' school, Coca-Cola in Belgium. You wanna talk about any of those things? Like, you know, this is what's the kind of thing that, that is a you know, predecessor of this. Yep. Well, um, given that's the Philadelphia skeptics, uh, I can talk about Ben Franklin. Um, but before I do, put it in context. This is nothing new. This is a technology scare. There are often scares surrounding new technology. Um, when the telephone first came out, you would occasionally hear a mild crackling sound. But because it was this new uh, 
technology that people were hearing that it was believed that it was making the telephone operators sick listening to this crackling sound, which, which would come on intermittently. It wasn't that often. Um, and one of the symptoms was concussion-like symptoms, concussion without a concussion, which is very similar to uh, Havana syndrome. Um, when ice cubes first were developed with refrigeration, people were afraid that they were making them sick because it was created from artificial uh, means. You've got AM radio in the early days. You have, um, well, KDKA Pittsburgh is one of the first radio stations in the United States, commercial stations, right? Um, when radio first came out, there was a fear that these invisible waves in the air were making people sick and affecting the weather. Um, you've got uh, everything from uh, mobile phones to computer display terminals uh, causing birth defects, the belief you've got the fear of Wi-Fi, um, all these things, um, the wind farm syndrome, where people think that if they're living in the vicinity of these wind turbines, that the turning of the blades and the uh, infrasound is actually making them sick. Um, and so one of my favorites is the Seattle windshield pitting epidemic of 1954, in which the United States was doing atomic bomb testing in the atolls in the Pacific. And there were reports that there was fallout in the Pacific Northwest. And people started seeing on their windshields, these tiny pit marks. And it became very serious to the point where the governor of Washington state actually telephoned the, uh, I think it was Eisenhower at the time and declared an emergency. And investigators went out and university researchers um, went out into the field and they looked closely at this and they concluded that those pit marks were not caused by atomic fallout. They'd actually been there all the time. And instead of looking through their windshields, they were looking at their windshields. And that's so typical of outbreaks of UFOs, of Bigfoot, chupacabras, right? You get an initial sensational report. And then people start to over scrutinize their environment and are prone to misidentifying rustling in the bushes as a Bigfoot, um, uh, a boat wake as a, a lake monster or a light in the sky as an alien spacecraft. So um, it's a classic outbreak there. So you go back in time to say Philadelphia um, and uh, Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin um, in the 1760s invented a device known as the glass harmonica with an A. And um, at the time, people would give concerts with glasses of water and it had different amounts of water in the glass. You'd wet your fingers and you'd, you'd rub it on the glass. It would make a high pitched tone. Well, Franklin took this device, which had a rod and spools of glass of differing diameters. And as you turned it with a foot pedal, you touched it with your wet finger and it made this um, high pitched sound and you could play it as a musical instrument. So this instrument comes out in the 1760s and it catches on and was very popular. People were giving concerts all over North America and in Europe. And the belief was early on that the tones created from the glass harmonica could actually cure various diseases. And people are going to concerts and claiming to be cured from a variety of ailments. And then a couple of prominent glass harmonica players became unwell because people become unwell and there were hundreds and hundreds of players. And the folk theory emerged that actually the glass harmonica can make you sick. And then people started going to concerts and women were fainting, people were feeling unwell, claiming that the glass harmonica was making them sick. 
So in the course of a few years, the glass harmonica went from a placebo to a nocebo. And it's a fascinating case in the history of, of science. Yeah, I, I've never heard that before. And, and I've never heard of anything switching like that. Uh, and it was fairly quickly it switched and it kind of destroyed the instrument. Can, can I just mention one other thing? And that is in the Bristol Zoo in England, uh, a few years ago, um, at about the same time it was being reported in the media that those humps on the tops of giraffes actually created a vibrating sound that other giraffes at night could hear and they could communicate with each other. That was big news for about a day, I think, as a kicker story around the world. And when that came out, a group of people living near the giraffe enclosure at the Bristol Zoo started to complain that they could hear humming sounds that were keeping them awake at night and making them feel unwell. And it was from the giraffe. And uh, so they complained to the zoo. And the zoo was saying things like, well, none of our keepers here who are exposed to the giraffes all the time were complaining of symptoms. And by the way, throughout the entire history of the world, I'm not aware of anybody complaining of giraffe sounds, making them uh, having difficulty sleeping and hearing uh, humming like sounds. It, it, it can't be, it, it's not within the realm of human hearing anyway. Anyway, so um, you had over, uh, was it 120, 130 people filing a complaint with the zoo, with the giraffe enclosure. And so you can see how these um, outbreaks can, and you've got the hum, the mysterious sound heard around the world, right? In, in all different areas. And when you look at these and they've done localized studies, they turn out to be um, local industries with uh, equipment that's vibrating and tinnitus and a variety of mundane uh, explanations. Yeah, you, you summarized it in one, in one phrase in the book, I think. Humans have a remarkable capacity for self-deception. Yeah, and what's the old saying in sociology? The Thomas theorem. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. That was written in 1923. I would also add uh, women to that as well here in uh, 2022. So, so the, the, one, the one incident that I listed, if you remember the details, that would be, I think, interesting because it was more akin to uh, Havana syndrome Mike, because it was supposedly people were being attacked. The, the residential gas attacks in the U.S. homes. Yeah, the, you had the mad gas from Mattoon in Mattoon, Illinois, in uh, the fall of 1944. And uh, so people reported being gassed in their homes with a mysterious gas. There were dozens of attacks. And it's a famous case in the history of uh, psychology. It was written up in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology in 1945 by M. Johnson. And um, it's a classic case. And so what you ended up having in Mattoon, Illinois in, at the time was it didn't occur in a vacuum. Just before that happened, you'd had a lot of discussion about what if the Nazis use poison gas on Americans? What are we going to do? So that was in the news. And then just before the attacks, there was an escaped Nazi, uh, Nazi sympathizer in that area. And then someone woke up and they, they smelled this unusual smell. It became newspaper headlines that there was an attack. And then it became real in its consequences, dozens of cases. And then eventually, the police concluded that there hadn't been any attacks, that it was just uh, normal smells that are there. Um, in one case, it was concluded to have been uh, gardenia flowers um, next to the window where the woman had her window open. And this is so typical of outbreaks like this, of Bigfoot, UFOs, um, where people start over scrutinizing their environment for evidence of the intruder or whatever it is. 
And with Havana syndrome, go back to the Salem witch, witch hunts of the 1690s. If someone came up to your house in 1692 and visited you and you had a headache and your cat died, well, this person's a witch. Clearly. I've been bewitched. And then the next thing you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're being accused. To so quote John Baldwin, start, there is no other explanation. That's right. And you start over scrutinizing your body. Look, not every case is mass psychogenic illness. Many of the victims in Havana syndrome, and particularly around the world with all this mass suggestion, are getting up in the morning and having headache, nausea, difficulty concentrating, because ever since we've lived in caves, people get up in the morning and they have headaches, nausea, and difficulty concentrating. It's part of the human condition. So it's really a combination, people who are, who are victims of this, it's some combination of the nocebo effect and people just have the symptoms anyway and attribute it to this thing they've heard about. That's right. And uh, um, I wonder so what the percent is. What, what, what would you think the percent is there? I think globally, internationally, the 1,000 plus cases that's mostly, as the CIA interim report concluded, just a variety of medical conditions that people have. And conditions, a lot of this is uh, having to do with migraines and the vestibular system, which has a whole array of conditions. Like this woman at the White House and the 60 Minutes report, she said she was walking near the White House and she felt dizzy and had difficulty with her spatial awareness. Mm -hmm. That's the vestibular system. And Scott Pelley at 60 Minutes should have known that if they were in constitution with any neurologist worth their salt. And that's right. why I have a bone to pick with 60 Minutes. And I think it was just sensationalist and really disingenuous on their part to stack the deck there, give mundane alternative explanations for that. Um, what's more likely? You know, something involving the vestibular system that 40% of people, 35 to 40% of people will have in their lifetime or some new weapon of which um, they've never come up with a weapon. Um, and it, it, it's just, what's the more likely explanation? Yep. Okay, so wrapping this up, uh, what do you see as the ultimate lesson to be learned from this? Well, in the internet era, I don't think this would have survived the non-internet era with the media, but in the internet era, um, when there's so, much, uh, there's so much misinformation out there and so little critical thinking that many people have stopped searching for information. And instead, they're searching for confirmation and affirmation of their own pre-existing beliefs. In psychology, that's known as confirmation bias, the tendency to seek out information that reinforces pre-existing biases, stereotypes, and beliefs. And then the news media is under pressure with the, um, with the transformation of its profession. And I think they're under pressure to clicks and views I always respect 60 minutes. I don't anymore after a report like that. And um, so you've got bad journalism, bad government, and bad science. And yes, we have the internet and we can have forums like this to discuss this, but there's so much stuff out there, particularly on Facebook and Twitter, that is simply untrue. CNN, NBC, CBS, if you're listening, stop referring to the victims in Cuba as victims of brain damage. It is demonstrably false. It did not happen. And my question to you is, were you not consulting mainstream neurologists on this? I think this is settled science. It's pretty clear at this point, but it's not in the media. And that's unfortunate. Okay. Thank you. It's been very informative. Uh, and, I, and I will suggest to others uh, to uh, get the book. I mean, if you're on the fence and I still see some comments popping up, people maybe still don't believe this. 
I don't see how you can like read all of the details in, in, in this book and still come to the conclusion that something nefarious is going on here. All right, let me turn it over uh, to Dariva. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Thank sure, you. I'm happy to answer. Any Anybody want, want to ask a question, bring it on. Yes, so we will be reading questions from the Q&A section here on Zoom. And before I do that, I'm just going to remind people uh, when you're entering your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, please be clear and concise. First, I'm going to start with my own question, uh, since it's my prerogative as co-presenter. Um, what is the effect of popular culture? In other words, fiction, radio, uh, television, films on theories like Havana syndrome. So for example, um, auditory based attacks that people may have seen in things like Star Trek or James Bond or other popular media or scares induced like uh, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds broadcast or my personal, uh, one of my personal favorites is the 1935 movie, Murder by Television, starring Bela Lugosi, where uh, people are killed through the television broadcast. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that during the 1938 War of the World scare, uh, where they had the uh, Orson Welles radio play about Martians invading Earth, uh, based on the H.G. Wells novel from 1898, The War of the Worlds. Many people don't realize that during that broadcast, and this is documented, a number of people, uh, most people didn't panic and actually try to flee, but a number of people were frightened. And several people uh, called police to report that, now on the radio, they described Martians firing heat rays and poison gas. People actually called police to say they could feel the heat rays as described on the radio and that they were coughing and choking on the poison gas and shoving rags underneath their doors and in keyholes. Some people uh, in the New York, New Jersey area where this was thought to have happened actually claimed to be able to see the Martians on their giant machines in the distance. Um, but yes, uh, popular culture, I think has an important influence here. And, uh, but there's something called the laws of physics. And, you know, it's not possible to um, specifically target someone. And, and, you know, this isn't at the US Embassy where these things happened. Most of these events occurred in one of two large hotels in Havana, Cuba. It's not possible to specifically target someone with a sound wave inside a large hotel, and you'd certainly have many other people uh, affected as well. You'd have to have a massive device, it wouldn't work. Um, for a microwave, the same thing, you, you'd to have brain damage, um, that would show up in an MRI and it hasn't. Um, but yes, popular culture, you've got all this stuff. And up until what, during the 70s, 80s and 90s, I would say the villain uh, in a lot of TV shows has been the Russians. And um, so you've got them as, as, a, as a popular evil force out there. And I, look, I'm not gonna talk about Ukraine. I'm, I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing there. Um, it's very unfortunate. I'm certainly not supporting what's going on there. Uh, it's a terrible thing. But prior to this time uh, in popular media, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, the usual suspects have been the, have been the targets right, of, uh, of, of popular um, beliefs about uh, mysterious weapons. Okay, thank you. Okay, could Havana syndrome be related to the power of suggestion as occurs with believers in voodoo and other cult religions? Absolutely, because what you've got going on there is the, the nocebo effect. And, you know, it's, it's, Really, if it's plausible, it's possible. And that's the key because in different cultures, different things are plausible. You often hear in parts of Northern India, some really strange um, social panics going on about monsters and strange creatures. And to us, it seems so ridiculous. But for someone 
who is living in that culture. It's real. And I don't know if anybody's seen the movie um, Big Trouble in Little China, but I can remember going to Australia years ago and studying in South Australia. And I went to see the movie. And on the way back on, on, on the bus, I was going to uni at the time, um, I had a group of students from Malaysia and I was chatting with them. I said, so what do you think about the movie? And uh, they go, oh, it's really interesting. And I said, well, it, it kind of was unrealistic for me because you've got these ancient Chinese warriors who are doing like six backflips and spinning around their weapons. And it was just so unrealistic. You couldn't do that in real life. And they were like, well, maybe. And I'm like, what do you mean maybe? And they said, well, we believe in the, that, that there are these beings that um, do have these supernatural powers and, and, and maybe it's possible. I was just thinking to myself, well, um, so they come from a culture or a subculture within that country and culture where they believe that these supernatural creatures, beings may be real. And, and so it was more realistic for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So have uh, either you or your co-author looked at medical reports of the supposed victims? So I believe this goes to the FOIA requested data or other research that you've conducted. Yeah, here's the problem. The problem, people say, oh, you, you don't know about my case. Well, tell us about your case, right? On the 60 Minutes episode, there was a woman claimed she was breastfeeding and was attacked and that she, she went to a medical center and they said they both had brain damage. Okay, that's it. They're not giving us any more information. But here's what I do know. The JAMA studies, okay? When you do have information, and they have done the studies. There's no evidence that these people were suffering from brain damage. Um, there's a CIA officer um, who, uh, Park, uh, Mark Palamoropoulos, I believe his name is, and he goes out and he gives talks and says that he suffered brain. Give us more information to go on. And maybe you do have brain damage, but who says it's caused by some kind of microwave attack um, or acoustical attack. Um, there's all kinds of medical conditions out there. And sometimes people do have brain damage. It doesn't mean it's caused by some kind of secret weapon. Okay. So we have a question about ultrasound waves. Isn't it true that ultrasound waves can't be recorded by ordinary microphones or normal recording devices? Um, can you talk about that? Well, not sure. Uh, in terms of uh, being able to record uh, ultrasound. But in terms of um, being able to attack somebody with something like that, um, I mean, they use ultrasound to, to look into the womb, right? I mean, um, and you know, if you look at experts who are specialists in ultrasound, uh, they dismiss that ultrasound is involved. And you'd have to be very close up at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it true when they do, you know, natal uh, exams for that, they actually have to put a jelly substance. So there's no air gap at all. Yeah. And, and the other thing is the microwaves. People keep coming out and saying to me, oh, there's all this stuff. I read it on the Internet about the United States government has been um, researching microwaves for years now as a weapon. Yes but there's something called the laws of physics and it didn't work out very well. It's the same reason why Vladimir Putin doesn't have a whole bunch of microwave weapons uh, operating in uh, UK Ukraine right now. And if you look at things like microwaves, I have a little summary here of um, a study that was done summarizing um, where we are with microwaves from the journal Nature. Quote, despite 50 years of research, the U.S. military has yet to produce a usable weapon. And the title of the review was Wasted Energy. Again, you know, you have to deal with the laws of physics. This is the same government that from the late 1970s through the 1980s into the early 1990s spent millions of dollars investigating the possibility of remote viewing to try to listen in on the Russians and figure out what they were doing. Why were we doing it? Because we heard the Russians were doing it. And um, great, 
try something new. Maybe there's something to it. After 20 years, they shut it down because there was no evidence that it worked. Indeed, indeed. Remote viewing, a very interesting topic. Um, next we have, have you or your co-author had the chance to interview any of the sufferers or supposed sufferers, victims of Havana syndrome personally? And if so, what did you find? Well, first of all, let me just say that this is part of the problem. You get people in the State Department saying, I talk to these people directly and their, their case is so compelling. That is the issue of being too emotionally involved because mass psychogenic illness symptoms are as real as any other condition. So that's number one. We have talked to diplomats who were at the American embassy in Havana at the time. And I have talked to some of the victims, not many, but we don't need to talk to the victims. All we need to do is look at the reports, look at what they're claiming, and look at the results of, of the tests. Um, and so, again, this is part of the problem, people becoming too emotionally attached, too emotionally involved. And when people say, look, there's more to it than this, it's, it's more than mass psychogenic illness. These people are really suffering. Well, they are not experts then in mass psychogenic illness because people with mass psychogenic illness are really suffering. And look, the other aspect here I think is important to note is there's two main types of mass psychogenic illness. There's the common type in Western countries where it's usually triggered by an unusual or unfamiliar smell. And there's an ultra rapid group consensus and you get headaches, nausea, dizziness, uh, fainting. It usually lasts for no more than a few hours. There's rapid onset and recovery, and that's the end of it. The thing that's going on in Cuba is involving neurological symptoms. That's more like what happened in Salem, where there's no pre existing group tension. And so you get this buildup of prolonged stress, extreme stress. What's extreme stress? that you've been told when you go to Cuba that you're gonna be surveilled 24 seven, that you have your children over there. And then someone says, oh, it appears that a foreign actor has developed a new type of weapon and they may be targeting you at your home at night. Don't sleep or stand near your windows. And if you have any symptoms, please report them to us right away. By any, and you're in a foreign country, that's hostile. By any definition, that is stress in its prolonged stress. So the second type of mass psychogenic illness involves typically neurological symptoms. You get disruptions to the nerves and neurons that send messages to the brain. And so when you look at the cohort in Cuba who was analyzed, that's what you got picked up in the 2019 Journal of the American Medical Association study, you got minor anomalies. Uh, but in that study, they also said that the anomalies were not so significant. They couldn't have been caused by individual variation. Translation, they were not very significant. And they're the same types of anomalies that you would expect to find in a group under prolonged stress. Um, so I'm going to take a couple questions out of uh, order to keep with the flow of the Q&A. Uh, one question is, have any Cuban citizens reported similar symptoms? That's a really good question. So after this first came out in August of 2017, and it was announced that this had been going on, and of course it started in say November of 2016. When that happened, you got, I think the first report was with the Associated Press came out with this big report about it. The Associated Press got about three dozen people contacting them within the course of the next couple of months saying, I've been to Cuba in the past few years and I stayed at one of those hotels and I had similar symptoms. And here's my question to the US government. How come you didn't investigate them? 
And when they came out and they asked the government about it, they said, well, our recommendation is that they see their a neurologist or see their own doctor, that we're not interested in uh, analyzing them. We're not interested in hearing about their cases. Why not? Why is it that it's a CIA officer or a US diplomat has these symptoms and somebody else who claims to have been there has virtually identical symptoms, but they're not interested in talking to them? Um, that's an interesting question. I think the government um, should answer for us. Mm -hmm. uh, related to that, um, are there any old time US diplomats who were stationed in Havana or other areas of Cuba in the 1950s and earlier who might be rather old right now, but might have memories of uh, those times and whether any such symptoms or any such uh, noises were around like crickets or those type of crickets? Well, the interesting thing is when I went to Cuba, uh, I was talking to the, the head of the neuroscience center there. They didn't know that the Indy short tail cricket was in Cuba. They only discovered it recently, um, which is interesting. And it's not a very common cricket uh, in, in, uh, in that region, but it is in Havana. And it's, it's one of the loudest uh, crickets uh, in the world in terms of sounds. Interestingly, since this is you've got people coming out from the 1960s, 70s, 80s saying, oh, uh, and there's somebody who was saying in the 90s were about me. And uh, so you've got to have interpretation. You go back in time. It's a problem with UFOs, Bigfoot, and all, all sorts of other uh, phenomena, right? Other cases. Um, you know, the, the human mind um, it doesn't exactly remember exactly as things happen, and things can get exaggerated over time. Okay. Um, are there any claims that this weapon, and weapon is in quotations, is being used on the Ukraine battlefield? None at all. And um, I, like I said, I would not be surprised if there are people in the White House because they think, they watch the 60 Minutes report and think they may be the subject of an attack, that uh, people will report being attacked. And my guess would be the government would keep that quiet at this point. It may come out later, uh, given the sensitivity of what's going on right now. But look, what 60 Minutes did with their report is a very dangerous thing to do, uh, particularly with the current circumstances of what's going on in Ukraine. So if the US government did think they're under attack or did think that Vladimir Putin was targeting our president or members of our cabinet, um, what would be the response? I don't know. But the good news is we now know that the main CIA, the FBI, and the group of elite scientists, the Jason Report, all are very skeptical. And I think it's pretty clear that the intelligence community at this point is skeptical, the majority of the intelligence community. So um, I think clearer heads would prevail there. So actually, I was gonna ask you that question and I didn't get to it. Do you think this will turn around and the US government at some point will say, oops, we were wrong? Yes, I do. because. That's where everything is pointing. And I think it's settled science at this point. And if you had the majority of the scientific community looking at our book, I am confident that they would conclude that this is an outbreak of mass psychogenic illness. Um, the problem is the media has kept playing this up with these claims of brain damage. One thing that we can be sure of, and that is in the studies in Cuba, of the cohort there, they did not show brain damage. We know that from the studies, yet you still see news outlets reporting that there was brain damage in the Cuban cohort. 
It's just not true. And then we keep hearing these things about and people say, well, what about such and such who said that um, they, they were attacked in China and uh, they went to the doctor and they said they had brain damage. Well, show us the report. And then how you know that that was caused by a microwave weapon as well. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm going to take uh, two more questions since we are coming upon 345 very soon and we, we should be wrapping up. One is, um, is there a particular psychological profile that is more susceptible to mass psychogenic syndromes? I get that question a lot. And the answer is no. Um, mass psychogenic illness is a collective stress response. It is based on a belief. We all have beliefs, therefore we are all susceptible. And the other thing is that's very conspicuous with what happened in Cuba, because that's the central case with the starting. It follows social networks. How come it wasn't reported by Cubans, by cleaners, by other people? Why was it just American and Canadian diplomats and their families. And by the way, the Canadians, people say, well, how the Canadians, how did they know? The Americans were sharing information. We know this from documents. The Americans were sharing information with the Canadians. And the other thing that's out there that people keep saying is, oh, early on, some of the patients didn't know that other patients were getting, uh, getting ill. That is absolutely not true based on the people that we've talked to at the embassy. And in fact, one person at the embassy contacted me, was at the embassy at the time. And I think it was Dr. Michael Hoffer who was involved in the University of Miami study had said that, oh, some of these people didn't know that uh, the other people had these symptoms. And they explicitly said, look, I wasn't gonna contact anybody, but I'm so upset by that statement. Everybody knew it spread like wildfire. There wasn't a secret you know, this was potentially affecting everyone's health and their children. We shared it, even though we weren't supposed to, and just everybody knew. Mm -hmm. So our, our last question, um, Malcolm Nance on MSNBC has talked about Havana syndrome being real in a matter of fact way. He is a security expert that MSNBC has on often. What can be done about this? Should Nance be called out directly? How would you approach uh, media who um, make these type of claims? It's very frustrating because my first career was as a journalist in New York State for several years in a number of different radio stations. I mean, as a journalist, I was taught in the late 1970s when I went to the State University of New York at Plattsburgh that you try to give both sides to a story. And I do think media outlets are under pressure these days. Um, if you are a person who is supposedly an expert in this area, I think you have an obligation to go out and read our study in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine and have a look at our book because clearly they are not, they haven't read the JAMA studies or they don't understand the JAMA studies. No competent neurologist in the world, no competent medical professional in the world can look at the 2018 and 2019 Journal of the American Medical Association studies and conclude anything other than that they were number one, poorly done, and number two, they did not demonstrate brain damage. I mean, it's just, it's not an opinion. It is so clear cut and it's, it's concerning. So I would urge these people to, look, I'll take on all comers, read the book and fire away. What question do you have? I, I had a, um, a prominent psychiatrist contact me a couple of days ago and goes, oh, I saw this. He's at the same university as myself. I saw you'd come out and said this. There's an article in the Guardian that said that this isn't settled science. Um, do you know what you're talking about? And I said, here, here's a copy of my book. You tell me where we're wrong. And his comeback was, well, I, I don't have time to read the book. Well, then too bad. Um, 
I, I will answer any question you have, um, but read the book or just read the article um, or listen to you know, what we're saying here. Those JAMA studies were flawed. That for nearly a year, we heard in the media leaked information that about a third of the Havana syndrome patients in Cuba had hearing loss. When that study came out in December of 2018, they found two patients had hearing loss, both of whom had pre-existing hearing loss before they went to Cuba. So there was no hearing loss. So what happened was they, they talked to the victims who before the hearing tests were given, about a third said they thought they had hearing loss. But when they gave them the standard hearing test, they didn't have hearing loss. And the other thing is people get seduced. I know this happens because I worked in the media. You're, you're not an expert on crickets or microwaves or acoustical attacks. So you go out and interview experts and you assume that they know what they're talking about. But in this case, the, and you see Journal of the American Medical Association, it must be true. I'm telling you right now, it's not, it's not. And I challenge, you gotta call these people, I challenge the editors to come out and, and back up those studies as solid science. Um, and the same for David Relman. I'd love to interview David Relman. And I'd love for him to answer the questions I've asked here, the head of the National Academy of Sciences panel. Why you keep saying that there was damage to the vestibular system when you have probably the world's foremost expert on the vestibular system, Bob Bailo at UCLA, saying, no, there wasn't. And how are you, how are you reaching these conclusions? And why they said that there was no evidence on the early epidemiological spread, so they couldn't evaluate mass psychogenic illness when our book was out eight months before that panel issued their findings. And he made it, he made it a point to say that most of the research that was done on his panel, the National Academy of Sciences panel, was done open source. That's basically looking on the internet and looking for what's been published on the subject. How come our book wasn't on there? And by the way, how come on your panel, you didn't interview us? I don't understand. All right, thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, Robert Bartholomew and Rob Palmer for a wonderful talk today. Uh, we appreciate all the time you spent with us and thank you for presenting at Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. As a reminder to everyone, our next meeting, our April meeting is going to be on a special date, not the usual one, April 23rd, and we will have Michael Marshall from the Merseyside Skeptics in the UK speaking on Inside the White Rose, an anti-vax COVID conspiracy theory ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So more about conspiracy theories. Thank you again. And this talk will be available in the future on our YouTube channel, Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you.